Welcome to the Heartland Running Podcast. Join Crystal, Andy, and Stephen as they explore all things running related in the Heartland and beyond. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Heartland Running Podcast. My name is Stephen. And I'm Crystal. And I have a confession for everybody this week. Uh, well, Crystal Ooh. and I have a confession. We oh, wait, uh, I'm getting dragged into this? You're getting dragged into it. Um, we have to confess, we put the ram in the ram o a ding dong but we had nothing to do with putting the bop in the bop, shoe, bop, shoe, bop. Nothing. So don't point your fingers at us for that one. Is that is That's it okay right. that I brought you on that, Crystal? Yeah, secret's out now, so it's all, uh, it's all good. Oh, boy. Well, <laughs> tonight we're going to um, explore maybe the tranquility of running. We have a special guest with us, Mr. Gary Dudney. He's been publishing articles on running, trail running, and ultra running for the past 20 years. His work has appeared in all the major magazines such as Runner's World, Running Times, Trail Runner, and Marathon and Beyond. Ultra Running Magazine considers the voice of the sport of ultra long distance running. He served as a regular columnist since 2008 and has been additionally supplying the magazine with dozens of uniquely quirky race reports. And they're kind of quirky. I've read them. His new book, The Tao of Running, was shaped by the 6,100-mile races he's participated in and almost the 200 other long-distance races he's completed. Welcome to the show, Gary. Thanks very much. Glad to be here. <laughs> we are certainly glad to have you. Now, let's just um, let's start off with what, what prompted you to write the book, The Tao of Running. Do you have a, a I don't know, spiritual is the right word, but maybe a background in, in Taoism? Or? Uh, no, I don't actually have. I sort of came to the different philosophies in the book through running. Um, I'd noticed that a lot of uh, runners had referenced mindfulness in their running, and I started studying that and learning about it. And um, the same with Taoism and existentialism. They're just different philosophies that uh, when I thought about running, I realized that, that there was a lot of, about running that was reflected in, in those philosophies. But I've been writing about running for a long time. I'm a writer. And um, in, in fact, I, in, I initially wrote another book, which was like a how-to book about running, a how-to book about trail running. And that's it's, it's a book that uh, had really been done many times before. But what I saw was uh, what, what intrigued me was the mind, the, the mental aspects of running. and answering the question, why does one run? Why why is running so enthralling? Why do people become runners? And, you know, it, you start out as just sort of a form of exercise, but then as you get into it, it sort of insinuates itself into your life. And um, uh, you, it, it, it's got a transforming effect, I think. Um, and it's interesting, you talked about kind of mindful running and, and we had put a um, Facebook post up within our internal group mentioning that you were on and, and kind of talking about your book and, and seeing if we had questions. And one of the person um, people in the group had brought up, they've actually never heard of the practice of mindful running. Um, so maybe you can kind of explain what it is and, and maybe what it means to you personally. Okay, well, mindfulness is the... Um focused attention on the presence with acceptance. Uh, and, the, and the man that popularized mindfulness in the United States, Kabat-Zinn, um, his idea was that you're, you're in the normal course of thinking, your thoughts are like a, a deafening waterfall, that you, you, you tend to start thinking about a problem and you get emotional about the problem and, then, and, and you, you follow that and it, it makes you unhappy. And then you start thinking about another problem and other things in your life are going on. And your whole thought process is um, sort of uh, you're zooming on this roller coaster from one one thought to another and attaching yourself to them and being getting emotional about them. So his idea was with mindfulness that you step out of that roaring waterfall and you do that by focusing on the present and focusing on what you're doing. And then as things, um, as thoughts impede on you, you um, acknowledge them 
and accept them, but then you let them go and you go back to focusing on just what you're doing. So mindful running is just using that practice while you're running, which is focusing on the, the running itself. And running is very inducive to mindfulness because there's so much to focus on. You've got all the physical things going on, the motion of your body and your breathing and the, the feeling of the air and your skin and all that sort of thing. And then you're outside and there's all the things going on around you, all the things you're seeing and doing. And the the what happens is that it tends to take you out of your normal frame of mind and and keep you from focusing on the past and the present, which you can't, the, the past and the future, which you really can't do much about, but you're just sort of in the present and really focusing on exactly what's happening to you right then and there. And uh, in a way, you're sort of, it, it gives you a chance to experience life firsthand instead of experiencing life through these these thoughts of your different problems and things um, that uh, happened in the past or are being worried about the future. Now, how long did it take you? Because I, I can com- completely relate to what you're saying. And I think like a lot of runners, I you know, you start out and you do that first 5K and, and move on up and you're focused on pace and that type of stuff. But when I started getting into running longer distances, I kind of noticed I stopped caring about that stuff and was getting more into the moment, just the enjoyment of running. And I would say it probably took a good year, year and a half into running before that started. Did it take you a while before you got away from the, I need to set this pace and this goal and just go out and, you know, be with the run, I guess is the word I'm I'm trying to say or phrase. Yeah, I, I worked up through the whole process of running a 5K and trying to run a faster 5K and then 10K and and trying to, for, you know, three or four years, trying to always set a, a new PR every time I went out. And when I ran, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about how fast I was going and that sort of thing. All that changed for me when I realized that I enjoyed running a lot more when I just relaxed and, and um I uh, tried to enjoy the process of running and tried to enjoy the journey of running and got more thoughtful about, you know, what running was doing for me in my life. I mean, when you're running, you're out there you're doing something for yourself. You're, you're getting healthy. You're losing weight. Uh, you're, you're taking a break from work or from whatever is going on in your life and doing, doing something for yourself. Your mind is, is free to, to wander and, uh, discover things about yourself you're exploring you know what your limits are and what what your body's capable of doing and you're sort of out there practicing this natural thing and you're doing it out you know outside where you can sort of commune with nature and that sort of thing i love it i feel like it took me a long time to get that point you said only a year and a half for you steven yeah it was about a year and a half or so maybe a little bit longer but it wasn't too long um i just i I summarized I really enjoyed that really long weekend run. You know, that that was my favorite one. Still is my favorite one. Yeah. I love or any time out on the trails and stuff. I love all that. Um, but we were kind of talking about, you know, moving up from the five K, ten K, doing all that kind of stuff. When people are, you know, kind of considering making that leap from the twenty six point two and kind of going further into the ultra distance. What do you think? How do you think they know when they're they're ready? Um, and then kind of also when people are finally ready to jump into that, what do you think they focus on too much of and maybe not enough of? Hey guys, Crystal here. As some of you know, I've been doing long distance races for almost 17 years now. During that time, I've seen a lot of changes and learned a lot. That's why I'm grateful for having discovered Sword Energy Drink. Previously, like most endurance runners, I carried my hydration and fuel separately and also because I am a very salty sweater. I would have to carry separate electrolytes or salt pills. Now, with Sword, I'm able to get everything in one simple product that contains only six natural ingredients. Recently, I did the math on what I used to take in during a typical marathon and was floored to discover that I was putting in over 30 different ingredients into my body. So, if you're looking to simplify your nutrition strategy, I would strongly encourage you to check out the information that's available at drinksword.com. If you decide you want to test it out for yourself, be sure to use the discount code HEARTLANDRUNNER to save 20%. Now, on to the show. 
you know, I, um, I think if, if you can run a marathon, you can certainly run, um, any of the ultra distances, ultras are, you know, considered anything over the marathon distance. Uh, so standard distances are 50k, 100k, uh, 50 mile, 100 mile. And, um, uh, if, if you're capable of running 26 miles, you can certainly run, uh, the ultra distance largely because, um, marathons, uh, I'm sure you can relate to this marathon runners tend to be very concerned about their pace and very concerned about how, how quickly they're getting through the race. And, um, walking is strictly forbidden. It's, you'd better run the entire way. You better run as hard as you can and give it everything you can. And that's different from, um, uh, trail running, ultra running. Because ultra running is much, it's a much more relaxed process, I think, because you have so far to go. Um, you can't run hard the whole time and, uh, you need to relax during the run and you need to, you know, marshal your energy for later in the race. And there are aid stations along the way, uh, that you stop at and have something to eat and drink and you have to, you have to eat and drink during a, an ultra. Um, so that, that slows you down. And there's the mindset's different too. I mean, most people, I think most ultra runners are, there's a big component of being out there, enjoying the outdoors, enjoying the trail, enjoying the experience of, of doing the run as opposed to, you know, how fast can I do this? Can I break my PR this time? Uh, that's not as, as, uh, critical for, you know, for, for people like me who are, in more of the middle of the back, back. I'm, I'm sure the people up front are competing hard and, and doing all those things, but uh, that's not really what my book is about. My book is about getting enjoyment out of the process, and, and, um, longevity in the sport, sort of thing. Well, I, I think um, it, your book is a great read for anybody that runs, and even people that don't run, but I think it is specifically an excellent read for people that want to make that transition from roads to trails and specifically trail ultras. You give a lot of advice as you were just saying on, because a lot of it is more mental um, because you're yeah. going to be out there so long and you're, you know, you're, you're going through so many things. And um, that, uh, that was one yeah. thing I really took away from it. And as far as moving up to an ultra, um, like I said, the, the, it's, it's a lot different from running a marathon, but, um, there's, there's really three things you have to be concerned about. One is that you've put in a lot of long runs, a lot of uh, long distance trail runs, just like you would do when you're working up to the marathon distance, you know, every weekend or every other weekend. Um, you should be out there for three to five or hours, uh, getting a lot of, a lot of miles on your legs. So you do have to have, there is a, a minimum amount of mileage that you have to put in. Although you don't have to put in mega mileage. You don't have to be running, uh, 75 or 100 miles a week. You, you can get by on, uh, 25 to 35, if you, um, uh, once you've been in the sport for, um, but then there's also the eating and drinking, which is much different in ultra running than it is in marathon. You have to be able to, um, drink a lot and eat a lot when you're out there in the middle, in the middle of the race. And to do that, you have to experiment with a lot of foods and, and energy gels and energy drinks and that sort of thing to see what, what works for you because you do, a lot of people have trouble with their stomachs and, and ultras uh, if they eat or drink something that doesn't agree with. Them. So you have to get sort of your, you have to practice your eating and your drinking routine when you're out on your long training. And then the other thing that, that you mentioned is the, the mental, the mindset. You have to be, uh, you have to practice going out there and running farther, or run, running past your comfort zone and uh, getting used to the, to the feeling of, you know, of, uh, dealing with the fatigue and the soreness and that, and that sort of thing. But so, those are the, those are the things you, you, you work on. But, um, like I said, with trail running, um, you have the aid stations out there. They're very, it's very supportive. Uh, it's a, they, you know, they have food for you and 
and things to drink. So um, you should really go out there and, and try a trail run and, uh, uh, you know, go go into it with a relaxed atmosphere. Um, don't try to run your, your fastest pace, but just you know, see what the see what the process is like. Now, how important would you say, I mean, obviously, when we're training for these, um, we'll just say marathon and above uh, the really long distances. Uh, Crystal and I just did a 50 mile race that we spent a long, long time out on the trail due to uh, angering the trail gods. But um, how important would you say is just having that extra time on your feet? What, what do you mean by extra time on your feet? You mean just having done a lot of long runs? Yeah, that maybe you didn't even get a lot of distance in a training plan, but you were out for a long time. You, you know, maybe you didn't get 35 miles on a training run, but you got six, seven hours being out moving around. Well, that's it's the, the, the time spent on your feet is a, probably a better measure for you than the distance that you ran. Uh, especially because with trail running, you might, you know, you might be, if you're running on more difficult territory, it might be taking you a lot longer to get through a run. It's not that far. Um, my, my friend and I do a, we go to a park that's not far from where I live and it's, um, very hilly, very steep hills. Um, we, it takes us like, uh, five hours to do less than 20 miles. Uh, but it's a, it's a, it's a great workout for ultra running because it's, it's, um, you're building your strength on those hills and, uh, you're building your strength on the, the roughness of the trail and whatnot. Um, you know, with trail running, it's so much different than running on a road because on a road, you just, you go through the same motion over and over and over and, uh, you're, there, there's not much variation in your stride. Whereas on the trail, every single step, you're, you're hitting at a slightly different angle and the, the uh, trail is steeper, you're going up and down, you're avoiding obstacles. So you're constantly engaging all these stabilizing muscles that you don't, that don't hardly come into play at all when you're just running down a road. So, um, it, it, uh, it builds your strength very quickly and it builds your resiliency and it builds your, uh, your nimbleness. All those things get better as you go out and run the trail. I love some of the descriptions in your book, especially, you know, right in the beginning when you described and you touched on it a little bit about just how running makes us feel. And when we're out there and some of those are, it's just some of those um, paragraphs and stuff gave me chills just reading it because you you know what that feeling is. Then as you go through and you really start talking about some of the trails and describing what it's like to be on there. And it's just absolutely beautiful. And you have a term that I love, which was called um, becoming a trail monster. And I was, you could describe a little bit about what a trail monster is. You, you touched on it a little bit already. Yeah, that's um, the trail monster. Uh, when you run on trails, I think it, it's it's a, a process that, that builds and you get stronger because you're running on the trail. And then because you're getting stronger, you're able to deal with more, uh, more difficult trails, more difficult situations. And, um, the more you do it and the more you enjoy it, uh, I think you, you get, you get hungrier for the, the process of doing it. And, um, uh, when you've, when you've, your attitude towards, uh, running changes and you, you, you want to get out there and you want to have, you want to make more out of it. You want to have a real adventure out there. You want to make it a real journey. And so you, you seek out more difficult trails and you, I like, I like to, I really love to go out when the conditions aren't perfect instead of trying to go out and run when everything is hunky dory. Uh, you go, go out in the rain or go to, go to new parks that you're not familiar with and, and explore, um, get into situations where, you know, it's, it's taking you a lot longer than you expected, but you gotta, you gotta sort of tough it out and get through it. Or do something like um, uh, run at night. I think one of the real thrills in ultra running is running at night because it's just so enthralling. Uh, it's so different than, than running during the daytime. 
Um, it's it's such a huge adventure. It's spooky, and uh, it, it's just a lot of fun. And all those things, I think you you know, once you start having those experiences, you just want more and more. You just you, you want to become a trail monster. Up so now running trails at, at night because we 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 <laughs> think we were going to be out on the trail at night when we did the fifty, but we were out on the trail at night. And did you have you, lights? But we did. Luckily, we we did have lights. Thank goodness. Um, I still didn't watch where I was going, and there's whole other stories and stuff in that. But what it what is the secret to running on technical trail at night? Well, there actually is one. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> that is, uh, you, you need um, you you really need uh, two lights on a technical trail. You need you need one on your head that's shining down. But the problem is that that it, it doesn't help you with your depth perception very much. So if you have a flashlight at your waist uh, and you're using that as well then that creates some shadow and you can see that the, the uh, you know the problems in the trail much better if you've got that low light along with your headlamp so it really takes it takes two lights to have a uh, really good light on on technical you also want to slow down and not kill yourself you know <laughs> oh we slowed oh, down slow. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah maybe if i had that second light i want to kick the snake but i had <laughs> Many, many experiences at night that were, you know, memorable things that I remember down in Southern California going along a, a road up, uh, up high on a ridge and there was a, an embankment above me and I'm running along and I look up and I see two great big green eyes looking right back at me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, not knowing what it was at first, it turned out to be a coyote, but, um, you know, at first I thought it might have been a mountain lion. <laughs> and then actually I did I did run into a mountain lion just across the highway from where I live. There's a there's this county park. I'm in Monterey, California. There's a county park across the, the street and I went up there um uh in the evening one time by myself and uh looked up at the top of this Jeep road and there was a, a coyote standing there. And uh, there's a lot of bobcats in this area, so we're seeing bobcats all the time. But I took one glance at this thing, and, you know, instead of this big perky ears, it had this low slung head. And instead of a little bob tail, that big, long, tawny uh, tail. So I knew right at that second that it was out. Oh, boy. And it just, we looked at each other for a minute, and... Uh, then I raised my arms. You're supposed to try to look big, you know. I raised my arms and I sort of started backing away and just disappeared <laughs> into the into the brush. See, no. but, uh, oh, you don't want to you don't want to be out at night by yourself if you can help. Okay, you know, and I've always heard about mountain lions and bears that if you see one, it's already decided not to eat you. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm thankful. I don't know if you can count on that in every situation. <laughs> wait, wait! You're not supposed to eat me. I saw you. <laughs> yeah, time you out! Time bear. out! Yeah. Give it the tea. Yeah. <laughs> the rule book says you can't. You can't eat me. Now I, I have a question, and um, I'm going to ask for Crystal and I because this is this is going to affect both of us next year. Uh, that you're an advocate of multiple races per year. And we just kind of know why is that and what does it take in order to do those successfully? Because we have a full schedule in 20, 2018. 2018, yeah, which how long? Whatever next year is. <laughs> Whatever next year is. Well, um, I'm not, uh, I'm not um, uh, keying on any one race trying to run a really fast time. Uh, I'm out there to enjoy myself and have an, have an adventure. So I'm, I'm never really going out and, you know, breaking myself down, uh, to the max. Uh, when I, when I go do a race, I'm just trying to get through to the end and have as good a time as I can. Um, in fact, what I've been doing is I've been, I, I like to, uh, I like to travel to do races, so I've been trying to go to 
every state in the union that has a, a hundred mile race and, you know, cover as much of the country as I can that way. So I go from, um, you know, I'm, I go to a new state every time I go race, um, get, get, meet, meet all the people that are there, travel around the area. And during the race, you get to see a hundred miles of trail, which is quite a bit of the countryside. And, and you get to sort of get a feel for the people that are there. But the one thing I do to uh, make that all possible is at the very beginning of the year, we, we can run pretty much year round here. So in January and February, my friend and I do a series of, of really difficult weekends. Like we might do a, we might do a 50K and then a week later do 100K and then a week later take, take a, take a week off. Then the next weekend do another 50K and then the next weekend do a, a like a 35 mile trail run or something like that so that we load up a, a whole lot of difficult training right at the beginning of the year. And that sort of gets us ready to do the racing later on in the year. And then after doing that, I can sort of go to the race and, um, then after, after, you know, the race itself is sort of training and then take a long break after that race and, you know, go to the, go to the next race without a lot of training going on the rest of the year. So I think that's very helpful. How many, the maximum amount of hundreds you've done in a year? Uh, eight. Oh my. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> years ago, I did eight. Wow. Wow. I retired, I retired a few years ago. And so that gave me a, the opportunity to just run as, run as much as I wanted to. <laughs> mm. I can schedule these races and trips. And, um, then I, so I run and I write basically. That's what I, that you, that's wonderful. <laughs> you, you, um, you talked about a lot of the, uh, your races in your book and you, you did talk a lot about Leadville. Is that, is that the, biggest monster you had to uh defeat in your running career so far probably um because of the altitude and i it turns out i wasn't very well suited to altitude uh so um you know when i finally finished it i was barely able to breathe and went straight to the hospital because i had uh, uh hape high altitude pulmonary edema so I, I, I found out that I was susceptible to that. And so, um, but I did, I worked with the doctor and there's, uh, there's some medications that you can take that, that help, um, help you with, uh, running at altitude. And so I, I, when I go to races that are above 8,000 feet, I, I take those. I don't get the, the hate symptoms that I was getting before. But yeah, that, that was a hard one. But then there are other harder races. The Wasatch is very hard and, and the Bear Eastern States is very hard. Uh, I just did a, a race called the Cruel Jewel in uh, Georgia uh, a couple of months ago that was, took me a lot longer than any other race I've ever done. But Leadville is unique because it's, they, they've stuck with the 30 hour time limit, even though it's a race that's all up above 10,000 feet, mm. a lot of people just struggle with that. So, so they're, they, they never have more than, I guess they occasionally get more than 50% of the people finishing, but very rarely. Wow. Yeah. What was the, the line from the book? Make, uh, make pain your friend and you'll never be alone. <laughs> yeah. yeah <exactly. laughs> I really liked that one. The, the guy in Leadville, Ken Clauber, he was yeah. an awful lot. He was an awful lot of fun. <laughs> he had, but he was right. You can do more than you think you can do. You just you have to learn to uh, uh, deal with the deal with the pain cave. <laughs> hmm. Deal with the when it starts getting the best. The best advice I ever got was from a woman named Joanne Dalcoder who wrote a book called Your Performing Edge. Her her one of her main. She's a sports psychologist, and uh, one of her main topics is that you have to stay positive throughout your, whatever, whatever you're doing. And uh, if you let your mind start going negative, then it, that quickly undermines you, tense up, and it just it's a spiral downward. So staying positive, no matter what's happening to you, is uh, is the key. And what, what she said was when you, you know, when it really starts to hurt, and, um, 
like you're 23 miles into the marathon, just killing you and you don't feel like you want and whatnot. She said, well, you know what? That's, that's how you're supposed to feel. Mm. If you're really out there and you're really pushing yourself and you're really going for your best and you're really, um, you know, trying to get your PR and whatnot, that's how it's supposed to feel. That's natural. And so you should take it as a positive sign. You know, there's, it's, it's not a sign that there's a problem, but that you're doing something wrong or that you didn't train hard. Enough. It's just the way you feel when you, when you really push yourself. And once you've, once you've, uh, sort of clicked into that mindset where you think, you know, this hurts, but it's supposed to hurt and everybody else, everybody else is hurting too. Um, they're not having any more fun than I am. Uh, then, uh, you can sort of, it, it takes the sting out of it. And you can sort of accept it for what it is. Mm -hmm. And in, in, you, you can also sort of, um, sort of sink into that feeling and, and maybe sort of instead of getting emotional and fearful about it and thinking, Oh, you know, I can't take this. I can't go on. You can sort of, uh, break it down. And, you know, what does this really feel like? Is this really killing me or is it just, is it just a real tightness in my chest or? You know, is that blister just sort of a burning sensation? And you, you find that you can deal with those, those feelings and keep going. And a lot of times you work through it and then it does get better. Mm. There's, there's, there's valleys, there's hills and valleys in the process. And if you can work your way through the valley, you can get back to a hill. I know one thing I do, um, is I'll get to the point I'll almost welcome the pain, accept it, you know, kind of like, okay, I acknowledge you hurt, but you're not hurting like injury hurt. You're just hurting. So do your thing and I'm going to go on. Crystal gets ultra happy. <laughs> <laughs> to the point, apparently it's irritating. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, I would never advocate running through pain if it felt like there was, you know, if, if you thought you were injuring yourself or something like that, but just the, the, the pain of the fatigue and the, and the, you know, being on your feet for hours and hours and hours or things like blisters or, um, skin abrasions, things like that. You can, you can, uh, get through those and you have to, if you want to run, you know, if you're going to run, uh, ultras, um, you, you have to get to where you can accept those things. And, and there's a lot of things to try too. You can sort of go to gallows humor and, and try to see the the uh, the humor and the fact that you're out there doing that to yourself, <laughs> and uh, you, you know you you could be home enjoying yourself, and instead you're out there trying to run 100 miles and it feels like you're dying. <laughs> and you paid money to you do chose it. Chose to do that, so <laughs> suck it up and do it. <laughs> well, I think um, a question I, I'm interested in. We had. Um, Gary Cantrell, Lazarus Lake, and Steve Durbin on a while ago. And, uh, especially Gary, he's real old school. And we were talking about how things have changed in the ultra running world over the years. And we're interested to hear maybe what you've seen change for the good and for the bad. Well, uh, for the good, um, there are tons more opportunities than there used to be. Trail running, has gone through a huge boom and ultra running has gone through a huge boom. When I first started running ultras, there were, you know, eight or nine hundred mile races uh, that you could do in, in the country. So you were very restricted as to when you could do that and where you could do it. Whereas now there are, believe it or not, 150 hundred mile races, sanctioned hundred mile races that you wow. can go to. So you can virtually you, you can race almost any weekend anywhere in the country and they're putting on a hundred mile race. And, but then there's, you know, uh, shorter, the shorter ultras are also very popular. And, and, uh, uh, there's also a lot of trail racing now that, you know, it's out here in California, the trail racing companies, they started putting on shorter events. So they, they'd still have a 50 K, but they'd also offer a 25 K and a 10 K and a 5 K on the same trail with, with aid stations and whatnot. And they were, they were getting huge participation, uh, for those shorter events. So there's the, there's 
just tons of opportunities now that you didn't used to have. And I'd say the, the, the people that put on the races have done pretty well in keeping up the support, um, you know, uh, supplying the aid stations and, and marking the trails and doing all the things you need to do to have a successful ultra. I don't think that's changed very much. In fact, I think people have gotten better and better at it because there's more and more people that are, uh, that have done it and who know how to set up a course and run a, run an ultra. It may be a little less, you know, personable than it used to be. You don't, you don't go to a race and know everybody like you used to when, when, um, it was a much smaller group of people. But, um, uh, as far as the, you know, we've lost something terrible because it's not old school anymore. I haven't really felt that as much. I go out there and have a great time. All the races I go to. <laughs> well, uh, there's 151 hundreds in a year. That sounds like a new challenge for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, uh, amazingly, um, the, the trend I spotted recently is that, um, there are quite a few hundred mile races now that are offering the 150 mile and the 200 mile distance. Hmm. It used to be there was this one race. I think it was called Pigtail in Washington that had um, a 150 and a 200 mile uh, option. Uh, you know, seven, eight, nine years ago. But now there are several races that um, uh, offer that option. They're 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 set up so that you can come and start running anytime you want. You know, go as go as far as you want, which mm-hmm. which is all new. Which which is telling me that people are finding out that it's possible to run a hundred miles, and some people are, you know, that's not enough for them, so they're they're going to run more. <laughs> Got to get through that first hundred first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well, Gary, we have what? some listener questions. Do you have a few minutes to answer them? Absolutely, right, Crystal. You want to read the first one? All right. So the first one, I believe this one, based on the name, is got to be from Instagram. Um, it's from wind horse running and they were asking what your opinion on, uh, chi running was. Yeah, I saw, I saw that. Um, well, I'm no expert on chi running. Um, so I can't speak to the, you know, the, the technical aspects of it. I know it, I know it, uh, draws on mindfulness somewhat and it's focused on the joy of running. So all those, uh, I'm, I'm sure those things are all very good, whether it works or not. I, I couldn't tell you. Wind horse, just just read the Tao of running. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, then we have, this is from Instagram as well, run the ultras. Uh, He wants to know, how bad did Eastern States suck? How did he know I thought it sucked? (laughs) 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 No, Eastern, I had had a real experience there. Um, it, it's it's a beautiful course. It's in right in the middle of Pennsylvania. It's called an area called the Pennsylvania Wilds, which I'd I'd never heard of. Um, but uh, it really gets support and whatnot. But it is a very very tough course, and uh, there are several uh, races in the East that have this quality where the um, the trails go up and down, and there are no switchbacks. You go straight up. If there's a ridge, you're going to go straight up it or straight down it. And eastern, the eastern states course had an awful lot of that. So I don't know what happened. Just when people moved out west, they learned how to build switchbacks, and they never learned that in the east or, or <laughs> what. But uh, the trails are different there, and eastern states the very rugged trails, very very uh steep long climbs and um i i tend to get later in 100 mile races i my mind tends to get confused and i start thinking i'm off course or i'm or i'm going backwards or or on the course or something like that and what happened to me in eastern states is i got to this area and it looked to me exactly like an area that i'd already been to I knew the course didn't loop back on itself. So I thought I'd somehow gotten lost and gotten back onto another section of the course. So I was wandering around yelling help <laughs> <laughs> because I thought, I thought I was lost. Uh, and, um, but I could still see flags around me. And so eventually I think it was the sweep for the race 
found me out there and told me I was not lost and I was on the right trail and whatnot. And um, he got me going again down down the correct trail. But every once in a while, I'd, I'd, I'd get confused again and think, think I was going the wrong direction uh, because it just didn't seem right to me. And I'd turn around and I'd find him again and he'd go, no, no, you're fine. You're fine. And he kept me going. I eventually finished with only like 15 minutes to spare or something like that. Yeah. But I, don't, I almost messed that. It took me an extra hour because I kept turning around. Wow. Well, you said you got you got more out of your entry fee. That's right. Exactly. So yeah. it didn't it didn't suck at all. Mile. I've gotten lost. You you if you run enough ultras, eventually you're gonna get lost every once in a while. I was in a <laughs> I was in a race in Kansas, and I started uh, talking to another runner that I was running with, and um, we blew by a turn and didn't know it. And so we're we're running. We're on the the in the Flint Hills, this is Heartland, and we're running through the Flint Hills down this this uh, road, and a pickup truck came by, and a guy, you know, just what you'd expect, a guy in a cowboy hat stops, and uh, he says, where are you going? And we said, well, we're, we're on our way to Texaco Hill, and he said, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> not this way. And he said, and he said what? And he says, you're in that race, right? And he said, yeah. And he said, well, you, uh, you missed a turn back there. So he turned us around and we, we, we had just been talking, uh, and there was a turn onto a trail and we'd been on the road, went, went straight by it. But luckily he caught us in plenty of time. <laughs> it was very much like that place that Jim Wamsley missed on Western States course. Oh, okay. You're on a road and there's a turn off onto a, a narrow trail. Uh, it doesn't matter how much stuff they put on the left-hand side. If you're just looking down at the road, you can miss it. We don't know anything about that. Yeah, no. No, no we never happened. Nope. It. it can put that. Too. Yeah. We shall never speak of it again. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, you know, what? I'm going to let you take the, the next question, Stephen, because there's a little bit of um, an announcement that goes in that. So I'm going to let you do that one. Oh, is there? Okay. Uh, this yeah, is there. from this is from Richard Allen on our Facebook group. First off, he'd like to know uh, how does he get an autographed copy of the book, and then he says, "Just kidding," but well, sort of. <laughs> so uh, maybe we maybe we can we can hook you up, Richard. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll we'll see if we can bribe Gary and pay him lots of money or something to to sign a special copy for you. <laughs> okay, but his question. I'll send him along. Oh well, thank you. Okay, his question. When I let my mind, air quotes, just go while running, I end up talking to myself. I end up talking myself into being hungry or needing more calories, gels, chews, food, etc. than I probably really need. I tend to eat out of boredom or as something to do, a struggle in my daily life that can slip itself into my longer runs. How do I know when to and not to listen to hunger signals while on a long run? Or at any point of the training cycle. Are you saying I eat too much, Crystal? I don't know. I'm looking at this and I'm like, can you eat too much while you're out there? Because <laughs> I was going to the bait stations like it's, you know, it's a buffet. <laughs> yeah, that whole, the question sort of puzzles me because I, people generally don't have trouble eating too much. I mean, most of the time you're struggling to eat enough because uh, especially later in a race, you you have trouble with your stomach dealing with uh, with solid foods. That's why it's so important to to you know try foods out ahead of time, figure out what works for you. But uh, I can't imagine how you could eat too much. <laughs> I was just thinking the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm there with you. So the an- the answer Richard, is eat, eat. Yeah, eat more, Richard. <laughs> I think Richard worries about. Uh, he's kind of like me. He was a, a heavy boy. Uh, until he joined the Marine Corps, and I think it, that he gets a little paranoid about packing on pounds. So mm-hmm. that's probably where his question came from. Yeah, yeah but while you're running, that's that's the time. Yeah, eat to up. Eat. <laughs> Don't eat the boredom the rest of the time, but when you're running, pack it in. You know, that's the problem I get is after the the race, especially in ultra, I want all the food, and I'll keep eating all the food probably a little bit longer than I should. <laughs> yeah. But that's part of the 
beauty of running is uh, it, it lets you indulge a little bit afterwards. Right. Yeah, but when you're going on week two, that... <laughs> Week two, month two, you know. Yeah, it's whatever. All good. It's all good. The the next question, the last question comes from Andrew, and I know he has a little bit of a um personal reason for asking this. Um Andrew's been in our face group Facebook group and he's been letting know next year he's going to be doing the Midwest Super Slam, which I know you're familiar with. But he wants to know, you know, seeing that you run sixty one hundreds, which means that you're running multiple a year, you talked about doing eight within a year. How do you keep saying? running all those multiples. So I, I guess really that mental aspect of it. Yeah. I, I just love every single race I go to. I, I've never gone to a race and not had a great experience and not found it just a great adventure. Um, I never get tired of them. I, I don't know why that is, <laughs> but um, uh, it's not a problem for me. I, I do as many as I can. Uh, you know, I need, Three weeks is a minimum between hundred mile races, and I only do I only do that if I'm doing something like the Midwest Super Slam where you don't have a choice. I would always put at least four weeks in between a uh, hundred mile runs. The the first week you're barely functioning afterwards, and uh, near the end of the second week you sort of recover. At the end of the third week you're more or less recovered. And then that gives you one more week to rest before you do another race. Uh, I do as many as I can. So the keys to love it. Yes. Love the keys it. To. All right. And then, as I said before, you know, I'm always out there just trying to enjoy the experience. So I'm not, I'm not running as hard as I possibly can. Yeah, and, and I think that's the important thing is to learn mm -hmm. to love it and just get out there and do it. But, uh, mm -hmm. Well, well, Gary, I see we're getting a little long on time. Uh, we want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, what's the name of the book again? It's called The Tao of Running, Your Journey to Mindful and Passionate Running. Now, I know it's available at Amazon because that's where I got my copy and Crystal got hers. Uh, can they buy this from your website? No, you have to go through Amazon or it's um, in, it's in a lot of Barnes and & Nobles and, and other uh, bookstores uh you can go through the barnes and nobles website there's a as you as you know there's an audio version and there is a, and the author the uh, actor who does the audio versions does a very good job by the way. well you you must know that Stephen. he d he does he, enjoyed a, it. he does an extremely good job and yes yes yeah. he, he does voices and everything i couldn't believe it yeah. when i heard it he really understood the book and there's a kindle version as well and um, I just recently signed a contract for a sequel. Really? So that will be coming Aww. out. That will be coming out um, uh, late spring of next year. Excellent! I can't. Congratulations! Uh, That's great. Can't wait to get a hold of it. Now, if people would like to follow you on the uh, on the interwebs, do you have uh, some social sites? Facebook, Twitter. Yes, I'm on uh, Facebook and Twitter, and then my website is thedowofrunning.com. All one word, the Dow of running dot com. Okay. And and that is spelled correctly as T A O in Dow, not D A O. Sometimes people spell it with a D. It can be pronounced either way, but I think the common way is Dow. Yes. A O. And we'll make sure to have links to all of that in the show notes yes. so people can be sure to find you. Super. Yes. So once again, we want to thank you for coming on. Uh, just an announcement. We have formed a, uh, a kind of a loose network of running podcasts. So you'll have a podcast to listen to every day of the work week, starting on Mondays with Man Bun Run. On Tuesdays, Training for Ultra. Wednesdays, Runified. Thursdays, Those Losers Over at the Negative Splits. And of course, we're on Fridays, Heartland Running. But uh, you can head over to our website, heartlandrunning.com. We have, uh, you can get the show notes there as well, too, plus all our videos. Uh, I think there's some other special goodies up there. And if you'd like, you can call our voicemail at area code 417-319-1060. And you can leave us a message. Tell us we're good. Tell us we're bad. We, we, we like all voicemails. But uh, most importantly, if you like the show, please tell a friend. Well, until next time, I am Stephen. And I'm Crystal. And thank you for sticking us in your ears. Head on my head.